Uh, my name is Matt Davis. I'm with the Federal Society, Michigan chapter, and we wanted to host this event tonight for obvious reasons. There is a pending Supreme Court decision that's going to come out that will probably affect, uh, well, actually, will affect the uh, Article 1, Section 26 of the Michigan Constitution, which is otherwise known as MCRI, the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. That initiative was passed in 2006 by the voters of Michigan. What it did was impose a ban on the use of, by government of racial preferences or affirmative action programs, however you want to describe it. So before I get going tonight, I'd like to bring up Penelope Williams from the uh, Michigan, uh, from the Schooly chapter of the uh, Federalist Society, just to say a few words of welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Penelope Williams. On behalf of Thomas M. Cooley Law School, and the Federalist Society student chapter and the a ACLU student chapter. We have uh, President Charles Hobbs here. Uh, we have a couple of faculty members that we want to recognize real fast. We have Professor Bretz, Professor Hicks, and Professor Marks. Unfortunately, Professor Wagner, which is our faculty advisor, is unable to be here. But we welcome you all to this wonderful debate. Uh, constitutional awareness. We have a little bit of a student body here, and we're all uh, delighted to have you here and have Mr. Matthews uh, hosting this event. So thank you for being here. And in the uh, course of recognizing people who are in the audience tonight, uh, we do have uh, two members of the Court of Appeal, Michigan Court of Appeals here, uh, just Judges Chris Murray and uh, Mark, uh, Mark Boonstra. Um, thank you, Your Honors, for being here. Uh, Mike Adola, who is Chief Legal Counsel for Governor Rick Snyder, is here. Matthew Schneider, who is Chief Legal Counsel for uh, Attorney General Bill Schutte, who is here. And also uh, Lisa uh, Gigliotti, who is Administrative Law Judge, who is here. So nice to see you. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, the person who's not here, but who will be, uh, inshallah, God willing, is uh, Trevor Coleman, National Award winning journalist, author, and executive uh, communications professional. Uh, served as chief speech writer for Michigan Governor um, Jennifer Granholm. Uh, Trevor is co-author of Crusader for Justice, which was the biography of Damon Keith, who's a Sixth Circuit judge, and uh, also was published by um, Wayne State University Press, and um, also is currently working on his third book, tentatively titled Struggle for Gen the Struggle Generation, a uh, profile of some of the men and women uh, who as young people um, participated in the struggle for American democracy and civil rights during the height of the civil rights movement. Trevor W. Coleman. Uh, also joining us tonight on your in the middle is Hans von Spakowski. Uh, Mr. von Spakowski is senior legal fellow and manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative in the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies with Heritage Foundation. Uh, Mr. von Spakowski concentrates on voting, elections, campaign finance, civil rights, immigration enforcement, government reform. He's author, along with John Fund, of Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk, which was published by Encounter Books in August 2012. This summer, he has a, another book coming out with John Fund, which will look at the, will look at the, uh, will look at the operation of the uh, Department of Justice under Attorney General Eric Holder. Um, Mark Fancher is on your far left. Uh, Mark P. Fancher is the staff attorney for the Racial Justice Project at the ACLU of Michigan. And through his work, he addresses racially disproportionate rates of incarceration racial discrimination against public school students of color, racial profiling, attacks on the democratic rights of communities of color, and abuse of police practices. Uh, before moving to Michigan, Mr. Fancher was director of litigation, uh, director of litigation for, uh, for Camden Regional Legal Services of New Jersey, um, has played leadership roles in the National Conference of Black Lawyers for numerous years. He's lectured across the country and written ex extensively on issues that include U.S. military presence in Africa, political repression in the U.S. and the land and resource rights of traditional indi indi I'm sorry, indigenous communities. And on your far right, over here, Jennifer Gratz. Jennifer Gratz uh, is a modern day civil rights leader. She's the most uh, well-recognized figure now in the movement to um, end affirmative action. Uh, in 1997, Ms. Gratz was uh, the lead plaintiff in the landmark case Gratz versus Bollinger, which challenged University of Michigan's use of race, of race in undergraduate admissions. In June 2003, the US Supreme Court ruled in Ms. Gratz's favor determining that the university's award of admissions points based on race was unconstitutional. In a companion case decided the same day, Grutter versus Bollinger, that's why they're often confused, the court allowed race preferences to continue in Michigan's law school. Uh, recently, Ms. Gratz co-founded the 14 Foundation, a C3 nonprofit, and Equal Protection Advocates, which is a C4. 
14 foundations uh, named after the 14th Amendment, in particular the Equal Rights uh, Clause of the 14th Amendment, uh, Equal Protection Clause, I'm sorry, 14th Amendment, and dedicated to teaching the personal and societal advantages of fair and equal treatment. Ms. Grant's story has been featured on numerous media outlets, including MSNBC, CNN, Fox, Dateline, 60 Minutes, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Detroit Free Press, Detroit News. Um, and uh, please um, join me in recognizing our outstanding panel this evening. And our moderator this evening will be none other than uh, Henry Payne. Henry Payne is, extreme, is very well known in Michigan and also out throughout uh, circ uh, media circles in the country. Uh, Henry is the uh, for a long for a long time was uh, editorial page uh, commentator and cartoonist for the Detroit News. He currently has uh, taken a position as writer. Here's Trevor. <laughs> the <time>, Trevor. <laughs> uh, he currently has taken a position uh, doing um, auto beat reporting for the Detroit News, but also still continues to write his um, uh, write or rather. Uh, Draw cartoons for um, United. Uh, I want to say United uh, Feature Syndicate. Uh, and so the format tonight is, is really uh, sort of informal. I think in the last maybe in about 30 or 40 minutes, we'll take some questions from the audience. But we're here right now. What I'd like uh, Mr. Payne to do is kick it off with questions to our panel, and then allow the other members of the panel to uh, comment as they see fit. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, it's, it's a this is a good uh, good panel. So I'm going to try to do as little moderating as possible. These four. People know a lot more about this subject uh, than I do. We're, we're going to go an hour, and um, so uh, you know about uh, seven, seven twenty-five, seven thirty, uh, depending on how the discussion's going. I'd, I'd like to open it up to questions. This is a nice, intimate room, so I think you can stand where you are and, and ask uh, any questions that you have uh, when the time comes. Let me let me uh, just start. Uh, with you guys uh, with with a broad question to frame this debate since uh, given the court case that's on our doorstep um, uh, in, in front of the Supreme Court hearing the uh, MCRI case uh, by way of the Sixth Circuit appeal we've been through we've been through Gratz been through Gruder been through Texas uh, uh, what, what, what's uh, why is this case significant and what, and what do you expect it to settle? Let me, let me start with you, Jennifer. Ladies first. Uh, this case is significant because the voters of Michigan chose in 2006 to uh, make race and gender preferences unconstitutional in public contracting, public employment, and public education. Uh, I think that anyone who was in Michigan from 2004 to 2006 knows uh, just how contentious that campaign was. Uh, in 2004, we started collecting signatures for the ballot. Uh, we were sued almost immediately. Uh, the lawsuit said that it was discriminatory just for us to be collecting signatures uh, to get on the ballot. In, we collected, at the time, the most signatures in history, uh, 508,202 signatures to gain access to the Michigan ballot, uh, and a campaign started. Our opponents claimed at the time of that campaign uh, that it was too easy to get on the ballot. It was too easy to change the Michigan Constitution. Uh, they also claimed that passage of the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative would eliminate breast cancer screening centers, uh, would uh, eliminate um, girls going into math and science programs. Uh, we claimed that it would eliminate race and gender preferences in public contracting, public employment, and public education. Uh, and what has happened is breast cancer screening centers still exist. Um, uh, girls can still go into math and science. Uh, but our universities, our public institutions, uh, our cities uh, cannot use race or gender to help or hurt anyone when applying for jobs, contracts, university admissions, uh, public scholarships. Um, just after the, the initiative passed by a margin of 58 to 42 percent, uh, Mary Sue Coleman directed her allies to find ways to challenge that policy, and sure enough, the radical group, by any means necessary, did just that, and the ACLU joined them. Uh, they, they claim that it is now too hard to change the Michigan Constitution. It would be too hard for them to challenge this policy to, 
using the normal um, means, uh, and therefore they've asked the court to step in and, and decide that the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, with simple language, is the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any group or individual on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public contracting, public employment, and public education. It mirrors the Civil Rights Act of, the 19, of 1964. Uh, they, they challenge that that violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And I don't believe that there's any amount of mental gymnastics that can get someone to the point where you believe that equality violates the Equal Protection Clause. Mark, you're uh, a party of this case, uh, represented University of Michigan. Uh, how do you see it? Well, there, there is a uh, great deal of confusion about uh, affirmative action generally and even more confusion about this case. And I think we need to understand certain things. One is that the question, the fundamental question of whether affirmative action is constitutional or not under the U.S. Constitution is a dead issue. As far back as 1978, Alan Bakke, a white male, uh, challenged affirmative action, the essence of it, in a case that he brought against the University of California. At that time, the court considered the merits of affirmative action and concluded that different treatment according to race is not always unconstitutional. And that if there is, uh, if it survives what the courts call strict scrutiny, in other words, if it is determined that there is a compelling interest and that it is necessary to use race in order to do it, and if a university narrowly tailors uh, its methods of ensuring diversity within the academy, then that survives strict scrutiny. It's a legitimate use of race in, in admissions, and that has been the law in the United States since then. When the Gratz and Gruder cases were filed, the court was asked to look at it again, and they came back and affirmed Bakke and said that as long as uh, race is used in a, in a very particular kind of a way, and they outlined the guidelines, uh, they set the rules and established uh, the ways in which this could happen and be, and be regarded as a legitimate constitutional use of race in, in, the, in admissions, then affirmative action is legitimate, it's fine, it's constitutional. The best proof of the fact that the court has determined that affirmative action as it has outlined it is constitutional came with the most recent decision uh, out, of, out of Texas where Fisher versus the University of Texas resulted in the court essentially saying that we've already ruled on this. We've already said that affirmative action is fine. It's constitutional. The only problem in this case is that you didn't follow our guidelines in the way that we wanted you to, and we're sending it back. So when we get to this case, you know, Sh Schutte versus Coalition, Schutte versus Cantrell, uh, we're dealing with a separate issue. It's a separate issue altogether. And what it really comes down to is this. If I choose to go to the University of Michigan's admissions committee, and I tell them that I'd like to talk to them about giving special consideration or even preferential treatment to people who live or who were raised in the Upper Peninsula, then they can have that conversation with me. And if they agree with me, they can put into place rules and guidelines that give preferential treatment to people who come from the Upper Peninsula. If I want to have that conversation with them about giving preferential treatment to students who in high school travel through Europe backpacking or bicycling, then I can have that conversation with them. And if they choose to, they can put into place rules that give preferential treatment to those kinds of students. We could do that with respect to anything. We could talk about students who play the oboe. We could talk about students who are athletes. We can talk about uh, children of alumni. We can talk about people who make donations to the university for pretty much anything that you want to go to the university as admissions committee and talk to them about giving preferential treatment to a particular group, you can do it. The only time, the only time that you can't do that is if you want to go and you want to say, listen, admissions committee, by virtue of the fact that some children who grow up as children of color in this country have unique experiences that are different from the experiences of those who come from the majority. And they can contribute to the intellectual discourse in this university. And they should be given special consideration when they want to come to this university. At that point, the admissions committee says, I can't talk to you about that because the Constitution says that I can't. 
And so unlike everybody else, unlike everybody else, the people who go trying to make the case for that have to go out and they have to collect signatures. They have to raise millions of dollars. They have to struggle to get the initiative, to put a, a referendum on the ballot about proposal two. They have to mount a campaign. They have to go through all of these hurdles, jump all of these hurdles, go through all of these hoops in order to do the same thing that everybody else can do by simply picking up the phone and making an appointment and talking to the admissions committee. Hans, uh, you want to respond to Mark and, and uh, also what do you see in, in this ruling? What precedent uh, does it set uh, for states? Or, or is it just for states, or, do you, or, or does, it, does it settle the whole affirmative action issue? Uh, well, look, I, I actually agree with Mark that, uh, that the courts have said that certain affirmative action programs are illegal. I think, I think those, those cases have been wrongly decided. Um, but uh, the issue in the Schutte case is, is quite different. And I have to say the Sixth Circuit's opinion is one of the most bizarre opinions I've ever read. Because the Sixth Circuit basically said that if the state uh, prohibits discriminatory treatment, if the state uh, says that uh, equal protection has to apply to everyone in the state, that is a violation of equal protection. And I was at the court when the oral arguments were made. Um, I think even some of the liberal justices were taken aback by the assertions being made in the case. I, I, I think that the Sixth Circuit is going to get overturned. And I have to say, I, I, I thought it was particularly shocking when the lawyer for a ban, or one of the parties of the state, actually said to the Supreme Court that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does not protect all Americans. She actually told the court that the 14th Amendment only protects certain racial minorities in the United States, which is one of the most bizarre readings of the 14th Amendment that I've, I've, I've ever seen. Uh, I, I think the case is going to come back. Uh, I think the Supreme Court's going to overturn it, and, and I would point to the fact that uh, when this issue came up, you, you know, in prior cases, particularly in California, you know, California passed a similar referendum just like Michigan. Uh, it went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the lawyers in the room here know the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is the most liberal uh, appellate court in the country, whether you agree or disagree with their decisions, and even they said uh, that the California referendum was fine, that it was not a violation of equal protection to mandate equal protection. Uh, Trevor, you want to respond to Hans? Yeah. Mitch, I think, I think um, the point that Mark was making really illuminates the issue here. I, I find it kind of interesting. Is that a, no, there we go. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. um, Actually, I think, I think Mark uh, really, I think, hit the issue here. I think he really illuminated what, what's really the issue here. And that is, I think the perverse, what's so perverse about this particular case is that while the opponents of eliminating equal opportunity, access to universities and colleges, you know, through affirmative action, claim that this is some sort of, I guess they're, by their definition, some sort of push for equality, the actual empirical results you know, show that it's not. You now have, there, there, in fact, there, there's a meme, an internet meme about being black at Michigan, you know, and black at colleges, where these kids have been literally marginalized on their own campus that their parents' tax dollars paid for because of, because of the shrinking population of, of, of underrepresented minorities at that school, in particular African Americans. And you've had, and in cities and in communities where once, you know, uh, African Americans could apply for jobs in public safety, these government jobs. These these things are now off limits to them in many in many instances. And so Mark is right. What this what this particular law did, it actually focused almost exclusively on African Americans, you know, and putting up barriers, basically what I would call rigging the system here, to keep them from getting access. And the reality is as much as you know, as much as you talk about equality stuff, because I find it interesting as someone who works in civil rights, you know, that you never had any civil rights organizations, any of the mainstream, you know, traditional civil rights organizations support anything that you did. 
not the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, not the NAACP, which are conservative organizations. Now that may cause your hair to stand out there because you don't understand African American politics. Conservative, traditional civil rights groups, the Urban League, the SCLC, none of them. War Conley never, War Conley visited Metro Detroit, never came to Detroit to talk to any civil rights organizations. I was with the Department of Civil Rights as Director of Communications, never scheduled any kind of appointment to talk about this, this campaign to bring equality you know, to Michigan, to equality to the universities. And the result is now these many years later, you have African American students, you know, who are at that school who feel like aliens on their own campus. And so that's the real life result, not this nonsense that they're calling equality, this kind of abstraction as if these kids don't count, as if their feelings don't count, as if their experience on that campus uh, doesn't count. Because actually you were saying before they got there, their experience didn't make a difference. That's why you that's why you you know push forth this this you know this initiative, you know, which you know which many people like us which many people oppose you know, for good reasons, for good reasons, and now you've seen the results of it. And so here you have, uh, you know, after the success you know, of the basic advantage from the action undergrad schools, you have one of the top tier universities in the country at Michigan, at UC Berkeley. In fact, there was a study that came out just early this year that showed that there are actually more football players at the University of California, Los Angeles, you know, football team than African American freshman students. You know, and here and here at Michigan, you have you have all kinds of kids who, who with all different sorts of backgrounds. I wrote letters of recommendations for at least four kids, who are white suburban kids, by the way. You know, you know, with their special skill sets and things that made a difference to go on campus, and there's no problem. But you take an African American student, you know, who journey, who made a tremendous journey over the course of their young lives to get to the point where they uh, could be accepted at the University of Michigan, and, and, and because they're going to make a difference, and and, and, they're, and they can share this experience in the classroom and help others students grow from their experience, you know, and now it's prohibited. So uh, the point I'm making, you can, you know, I think it's really about defining what equality means in the 21st century, you know, and whether you're going to deal with people as abstractions or you're going to deal with the reality of the situation that this has had a deleterious effect, you know, on students at University of Michigan, just like out in California. Yeah. Let me. Uh, can I can I respond to one specific? Well, let, let me let me just uh, move it on because because um, uh, 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 a couple of you brought up the the California example. I mean, it is it is ironic. Uh, given the history of, of the Ninth Circuit, that the Ninth Circuit passed on Prop 209 in California. We, we've had now almost two decades of experience of 209, which is a, a mirror of, of uh, MCRI in this state. You've had almost two decades of practice uh, of that law in, in California. Um, Mark, what do you what do you see in California? Is it, uh, is it as, as bad as opponents of Prop 209 thought it would, thought it would be. Yeah, I don't have direct experience there, um, but from what I hear, it has been a disaster. It depends upon who you ask. Uh, but but what I wanted to comment on, and I think it's really critical, because uh, those who support uh, this ban uh, make this point repeatedly. They say that this provision prohibits uh, discriminatory conduct, all right? It does not, at least not as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. Because what we're talking about are affirmative action programs that the Supreme Court has looked at and have concluded are not discriminatory. They're constitutional programs. And to make it clear, this is language from, from the Grutter case. It says, to be narrowly tailored, a race-conscious admissions program must not unduly burden individuals who are not members of the favored racial and ethnic groups. We are satisfied that the law schools, this Michigan's law school's admissions program does not. Because the law school considers all pertinent elements of diversity, it can and does select non-minority applicants who have greater potential to enhance student body diversity over underrepresented minority applicants. They found this perfectly acceptable. They found it constitutional. And what this provision does is it bans something that the US Supreme Court says is constitutional and legitimate and fair. It, it's, the US Supreme Court has said this is not discriminatory. And it bans it. And you, you know, we can only look at and speculate about the motivation for this. And I think it varies depending upon who supports the ban. But for those who say that this is a ban against discriminatory 
conduct or discriminatory admissions policies, as far as the law is concerned, as far as the U.S. Supreme Court is concerned, they're wrong. Jen, how about that? What's your motivation? <laughs> My motivation has always been for equal treatment for all individuals without regard to race. Uh, and I think that that's actually perfectly in line with what affirmative action was intended to be. If you go back to what President Kennedy said, and he was the first person to introduce the term affirmative action, uh, in his ex executive order, he said, we shall take affirmative action to guarantee that people are treated without regard to race. Exact words, without regard to race. You cannot say that the policies that, are, that have been in place at the University of Michigan, policies where uh, if you uh, were a black, Hispanic, or Native American, you were automatically awarded a 20% boost to get into, into college. You were awarded more points for your race than if you had a perfect ACT or SAT score. You can't say that that's treating people without regard to race. Now, I do agree with Mark that the U.S. Supreme Court has barely, has made it permissible, barely so, for race to be used in college admissions. He calls that affirmative action, I call that race preferences. Uh, I, I don't call it affirmative action because I do believe that affirmative action was meant to treat people without regard to race. Uh, what hasn't been mentioned is that in the Grutter case, which we've touched on a few times, uh, the court said that these policies would be tolerated for about another 25 years. Uh, and then they would not be tolerated anymore. Uh, the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative simply upped that timeline. Uh, the Grutter opinion also pointed to states that had eliminated these policies. They said states, in, uh, voters in California, Washington, uh, Florida, and Texas at the time uh, had chosen to move to race neutral means. And all states can and should move in that direction. Uh, that's actually where I took the directive to start the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. I was on an airplane from California to uh, New York City on June t the evening of June 23rd, 2003. That was the day, day that Gratz and Gruder were decided. Uh, and I read that and I thought, well, why can't Michigan be like California, Washington, Florida, and Texas? And that's how I started the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. Uh, I, I disagree with Mark that only people of color can't lobby the admissions committee. That's an exact quote. I wrote it down as he was saying it. He said, only people of color cannot lobby the admissions committee at the University of Michigan. Not true. Um, someone like me, who I think Mark would say is without color, cannot lobby the admissions committee to have my, my skin color uh, help or hurt me. Uh, someone like Henry cannot lobby the admissions committee to have his gender help or hurt him. It is equal in that way, that no one's race can help or hurt them. Uh, Henry, you asked about California and, and admissions. I, I want to talk a little bit about Michigan and admissions. Um, in 2008, the University of Michigan released a press release. They said that the um, uh, percentage of underrepresented minorities that had been admitted to the University of Michigan was at 10.47%. This is a direct quote that is relatively unchanged from prior to the passage of Proposal 2 at 10.85%. Now there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of talk about uh, admissions rates because of the case that's in front of the Supreme Court. And the University of Michigan put a brief in front of the court in which they claimed that, uh, that underrepresented minorities' ad admissions had plummeted since then. What they didn't tell the court is that they changed the way that they, they uh, kept that data in that the, the data that they presented to the court was only if you checked one checkbox. In 2010, the University of Michigan started allowing students rightly to check multiple checkboxes. So if you had a mother that was one race and a father that was another race, you could check multiple boxes. And the data that they presented to the court was only people who, pr who checked a single box. Uh, when uh, it, that was at 8.1% uh, people who checked a single box. When you, when you factor in people who checked multiple checkboxes, underrepresented minority uh, representation on campus was at 11.07%. To the University of Michigan, them presenting that data, our president, Barack Obama, would not be considered diverse to that university because he would check multiple checkboxes. 
That is unbelievable. That is messing with the data, and it's, it's wrong, and they should be reprimanded for it, quite frankly. Uh, the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, which I started, was brought to this state to bring about equality, to bring about fair treatment uh, without regard to race. And the people of Michigan have spoken, and spoken loudly, uh, despite all of the claims that, that are my opponents made during that campaign. Uh, and uh, the people of Michigan's vo voices should matter in this state, and I believe that Hans is right, that the Supreme Court will say that the people of Michigan had every right to say that their universities, that their state, uh, must treat people without regard to race. Uh, Trevor, let me, let me uh, ask you, and, and, and feel free to weigh in on the California precedent uh, as, as you see that, but we, we're, we're 50 years on from the uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is uh, about as plain as public law gets. You, you can't discriminate by race, sex, uh, creed. Uh, Fifty years on, clearly we are, uh, we, we have not met that standard. Uh, in, in your opinion, was, was uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act uh, hopelessly utopian? I mean, at what, at what point do we live up to the 1964 Civil Rights Act? Civil Rights Act. Well, I, like I said, I, I oh, sorry. What's what's always interesting with these kinds of debates? They get so technical. They don't deal with the reality, and and, and, and our opponents here never deal with the reality of what's it like to be African American in America. Because frankly, I, I don't. Uh, my experience is from talking to them, saying, to listening to them. You don't know African Americans. You don't talk to African American organizations. You literally don't. You don't talk to them. You don't talk to any civil rights groups. I mean, you have these kind of panels where you may have an individual from civil rights group, but you don't go into the community that you're most affected. I mean, Jennifer, like I said, when's the last time? Did you ever go to uh, NAACP conference, convention, to talk about this fight for equality that you're having? No, you know, but for you to say that I've never talked to no, African Americans. No, what Ward I'm saying, no, no, that's what exact, I'm, that is no, what you said. Can, Ward can, can, can we keep this not saying, on a personal, there's, there's no not reason personal, for yeah, personal yeah, attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm not getting personal. I'm making, yeah, I'm yes, making, I'm making a point you know, about how you deal in these kind of abstractions. The and you asked me about why 50 years after the Civil Rights Act, we still have this contentious debate over race in America. And what I'm saying, it's, it wasn't just because of a magic wand, you know, with the past of the 64 Civil Rights Act, that, that whites who oppose equality, you know, also are going to stop opposing equality. They fought this thing too thin. We're still fighting over voting rights. African Americans, you know, full citizen voting rights, you know, in 2014. You know, and so basically, you, you have a situation which I think fundamentally, I'm not dealing with the, this kind of arcane technical legal arts. I'm talking about just the reality of, this, of the situation where, you know, she talks about, well, the people of Michigan, white people of Michigan spoke. Something like 75% of whites, 75 80% of whites voted for this, where you had almost the opposite in terms of African Americans voting against the civil rights of the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. The same thing was in California. This was a racial issue, it was broken down by a race. White people support efforts to ban affirmative action. Black people don't. Latino people do not. Asian people do not. All right? That's what happened. You act like, you act like, you know, uh, after, after we're, we're just, just these kind of helpless spectators in this theater of our demise. You know, so you can make these kind of technical arguments. And so when you ask about the 64, you know, so why we have these problems, we have these problems because the system is rigged. It's gamed against people of color, minorities in particular. You have this disproportionality and poverty poor education, and the jobs. You have African Americans who can't get jobs because their names sound strange. You know, and, and studies and surveys show that. You have, you have black children being mowed down by monsters, you know, because they wear hoodies. You know, but, and an all white and This is all tied in to this, this, this whole historical narrative about African Americans in general and African American men in particular. But this is part of that as well. Trevor, because, it, because it marginalizes and makes it something other as we're some sort of problem people as opposed to person. And that, I think, is the subtext of this whole discussion about attacking affirmative action and attacking our right to vote. Uh, uh, Trevor, let me ask you just briefly and then go to Hans because I know Hans wants to respond, but, but, but to the data in, in California that we have, we have two dec decades of data now from California, and as you, as you referenced earlier, the, the admissions to elite schools like Berkeley are down for minorities, but if you look across the California public system, uh, graduation rates from minorities are up as, as, as kids have, have sort of uh, uh, gone to the schools where they are qualified for admission. I mean, that's, that strikes me as a much more mixed picture 
for minorities uh, the new address. Is, is California all bad or is, or is as California seen some good from the elimination of race as well, an admissions factor? Well, first of all, you know, I disagree with the proposition that, elimin that eliminates race. I think what it does, it rigs the system to allow whites, middle class, upper middle class whites and Asians, you know, I, I think it gives them preference over working class and poor people, particularly people of color. And also, I fundamentally disagree with the very concept, you know, that some, some outsider can tell the head of University of California, Berkeley, you know, or these other elite public schools out there that they shouldn't, you know, that based upon their own criteria of determining who's qualified to attend that school, that they can't, you know, that they can't accept these African American students, you know, because I don't like the idea that they're black. You know, people who you don't know, you know nothing about their lives. Yeah. And so the fact is, you know, whether these, whether more African American, if more African American students, and Latino students, and poor people of color are graduating from low tier schools, fine. It doesn't have to be either or. You know, you can, you know, these kids, you know, you can, you can have programs to encourage these kids to go to those schools, as well as allow these students, if the, if the university admissions uh, office determines that they're qualified to come to the, to go to the elite schools as well, why put barriers in their way? It's rigging the system. It has nothing to do with equality whatsoever. Hans, you've been patient, man. Uh, you know, I'm just amazed at what I'm hearing here, because what I'm hearing is a justification for racial discrimination. Discrimination on the basis of race and ethnicity is wrong. And it's particularly egregious when the government does it. You know, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts said that uh, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And, and I suggest you want to look at some data. Well, I've got a paper upstairs at the reception that I put out that cites a number of polls done on this issue. A uh, Washington Post, ABC poll, that's Washington Post, not exactly conservative organizations. 76% of Americans oppose race-based college admissions. Eight in 10 whites, eight in 10 blacks, seven in 10 Hispanics. Now, let's talk about um, the, the two grounds that are always given to justify the idea that it's okay to discriminate in some cases, but not uh, in others. It, the, 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 the reasons that are always given are either uh, remediation or diversity. Well, remediation, uh, the, the students who are receiving the benefits of racial uh, discrimination in their favor are kids who were in college admissions who were born in the 1990s, 30 years after the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act. And there are a huge variety uh, of federal and state laws that can be used if someone, for example, is Hispanic or black and they're discriminated against to sue and get a remedy. So, you know, the idea that you would punish some students today because of what happened generations ago and benefit other students who haven't uh, suffered that past discrimination to me is fundamentally unfair. The other thing that's very interesting about this is that when the Gratz um, and Bollinger uh, decisions were, were, um, were given by the Supreme Court, there was not a lot of uh, data on the effects of these kind of racial preference programs. There is now a lot of empirical data on this. And the empirical data is very consistent. And if anyone is interested in looking at it, I, I would urge you to take a look at two am amicus briefs that were filed in the Fisher versus U University of Texas case. Uh, one of them was by uh, three commissioners from the US Commission on Civil Rights. And another was by Stuart Taylor and Richard Sanders, who is a, a law professor at UCLA. And the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights took a look at it. They, they actually issued a report called Encouraging Minority Students to Pursue Science, Tech, Engineering, and Math Careers. And here's what the extensive empirical evidence shows on how it hurts minority students. And what they found was that students who attend schools where they're entering academic credentials put them in the bottom of the class, are less likely to follow through they make worse grades, they have lower graduation rates than, than if they attended schools where their credentials matched the average of other students. Now, this has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with you as a student, even a good student, ending up in a class where 
everybody else is ahead of you academically. Uh, that happened to me when I, I was an undergraduate and went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology under the mistaken impression I wanted to be an engineer. And it was when I was in differential equations and I was surrounded by people, I'd done very well in high school, but I was surrounded by people who were going to go on to win no, you know, Nobel Prizes. And you know, students who get accepted at elite schools, because the schools have lowered their academic standards for them because of their race, in comparison to other students in the class, their graduation rates are worse, they get very discouraged because their grades are much worse, and this has a ripple effect throughout the entire system. Those students, if they went to a second tier school where they are either in the same average as the rest of the class or maybe higher, they would probably be honor students. They would graduate, they would pursue these different careers that they drop out of. And the ripple effect goes all the way through. The elite schools uh, take people who should be at second tier schools. The second tier schools take people who should be at third tier schools. And so you have this ripple effect all throughout the system. It's called the mismatch phenomenon. If you look at those two amicus briefs, you will see that one study after another has found that. This even applies to the law of, of which I am a member. Uh, Richard Sanders got a hold of uh, the graduation rates and racial statistics and bar uh, passage rates from universities, and he found that um, uh, Students who had received racial preferences had lower graduation rates, had lower bar passage rates. That didn't happen when students had been admitted to schools where there weren't preferences, where in fact they had the same kind of average credentials. Look, this is common sense. Anybody who's been a student would understand this. It's just when race gets tied into it that suddenly it becomes controversial. The, the point is, is that's why there are fewer people, according to these studies, fewer racial minorities in many professions like the law, medicine, and elsewhere because of these, this racial preference system. It really hurts the people who are supposed to be the intended beneficiaries. Trevor, you're smiling there. You want to respond? Yeah. See, this is what I mean by the big lie, and the, the absurdity of what he said. Even, even with his statistics, you know, and, and, and it goes to the heart of, you know, if, you're, if you are part of the African community, and you're relatively conscious, and you know about your civil rights, and you understand the reality around you, you, know, this, you could use this, this is so subjective, you know nothing about the lives of what you know, it takes. It, first of all, you work on the assumption that schools like Michigan and UC Berkeley and these other major so-called elite public universities you know, take people who are unqualified. I recall being at a discussion where you and Carl Cohen were talking to the Michigan Alumni Association several years ago, and um, this is this is on campus at Ann Arbor, and at, at the time the, the director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, Judge Linda Parker, was there and I had accompanied her. And uh, if someone had asked, well, you know, so are you saying that Michigan's accept un people who are unqualified to the and, 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 and Cohen said, no, of course they're qualified, but they're not as qualified, you know, basically as, as the white students who he was supporting. You know? And so when he, this guy talks about, well, there's a mismatch between these minorities, and also there seems to be this obsession, almost a fetish, you know, with minority students. What about, you know, did he take a look at students who come from elite families, like the George Bushes, or students who are accepted because they're from northern Michigan, or students who are accepted for other for reasons other than strictly, you know, what their academic performance is. And again, I reject the whole premise, you know, that somehow all these students who are African American students in particular who are accepted into these universities are unqualified. I, I, I'm working on the assumption that the director of admissions and the admissions team takes a comprehensive look at these kids' records and their backgrounds and their potential, you know, and they let them in based upon their record and what they see that they can achieve. And if you have your statistics that show that, you know, while they don't matriculate at the same rate, well, there's also the issue of economics, you know, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the economic duress of many African American students because of poverty and these other issues are under. There's also these social factors and cultural factors on campus. You know, there's a lot of psychological energy, you know, that these students expound on campus. I, mean, I can only imagine, I, I could give this a personal example. My, my cousin's son was being recruited by Michigan Brilliant kid, and, um, and my cousin was actually the dean of students at Hampton, 
Yeah. And, and, be, and this was during a whole debate over affirmative action stuff, right, like a 1998 or something like that. And, and, he, and he came up here, they checked out, and he said, forget it, because he didn't want to toss his son in the middle of this, this racial cauldron, and his son ended up going to Brown. Yeah. And so the fact is, though, you know, I've talked to a lot of students at the University of Michigan. I gave the, the keynote speech at the Black Celebratory, taught to the kids, their parents, you know, and these kids, are, these kids are now, you know, doctors and lawyers and writers and journalists, you know, you know they're very successful people. You know, they're, not, they're not taking someone with, with D averages and C averages. That's what you seem to be implying. These kids are competitive with everyone else, you know, and if they take longer to graduate, there could be all sorts of factors. It's not because they were, they were brought in unqualified. You know, if there's all, you, you don't, you know, there's just generally, if you look at the profile of most African American students on these large elite universities, even if they come from middle class families, disproportionately many of them, you know, are financial aid, or they come from working class families, or many of my first, first generation, so there's all kind of factors. And just, you can't say just because you know, they're black and therefore you're assuming that they couldn't, they couldn't keep up with the work. And plus it doesn't matter in the end whether they graduate in four years, five or six years, the fact that, they, that they're there and they complete the journey, that's what the bottom line is. Uh, uh, Jen, let me, let, me, uh, let me stop there because I do want to get to address any questions from the audience. Uh, we got about uh, 15 minutes left and Matt, what do you got up there? Um, was Bakke wrongly decided? Should, I mean, should there be, because at some point you say you want a certain amount of diversity in a school. It's got to be X amount. How do you figure out X amount unless you set what X should be, and that X has to be a quote? How do you achieve diversity without counting heads and saying we now don't have quotes? So, I mean, is Bakke, did Bakke wrongly decide? Mark, maybe you could. <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I have two answers to that question. I mean, it is what we have, all right? And, uh, you know, what runs through that whole line of cases, Bakke, Gratz, Gruder, uh, and even Fisher, is a reference to the fact that universities are given a certain amount of deference uh, when it comes to making a determination about uh, the extent of diversity that they need. Uh, that they are in the best position to decide what will promote the, the, the best academic environment at their particular institutions. So it's really a subjective question. Is it wrong? Is it right? Uh, you know, wh who's to say? But it is what we have. But my second answer to this question is that, in my personal opinion, uh, it is a manifestation of what is fundamentally wrong in this country, historically and what leads to the creation of something like uh, the Proposal 2 or Section 26. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I try not to spend a lot of time uh, trying to educate white people about themselves, you know, but uh, James Baldwin said that black people know more about white people than they know about themselves, and it is true, uh, because we study you carefully. We have to for our purposes of survival. survival. And uh, one of the things that is true is that in this country historically, it has been a, a question of power. In the, in the beginning, there was a small circle of white males who had all of the power, and everybody else had no power. There were enslaved Africans who were at the bottom of the heap. But right above them were a whole class of very poor white people, very poor. They had all kinds of names for them, not polite names, white trash, linheads, all kinds of names. They barely made anything. They worked very hard. They were abused. But those who had power understood clearly that if they were to preserve their power, they were going to need the allegiance and the alliance of this community of people. And so they created something that white people don't like to talk about, which is white privilege. They attached to whiteness a certain uh, privilege that is not held by people of color. So that even these people who were desperately poor and who were oppressed in their own right got into the habit over the course of generations of fighting desperately to preserve their white privilege. Even as bad as their condition was, no matter how oppressed they were, no matter how put down they were, they could always comfort themselves with the thought, well, at least I'm white. And they have fought to preserve it. And so what has happened is, out of that has grown almost a sense of entitlement. So that when things don't go the way that they historically have gone in terms of white privilege bearing fruit, 
and they see something like affirmative action where somebody else manages to get in, then that jars them. It creates a dissonance, you know, discomfort, and they react. And so that what happens is that when you have a situation, and I'm not personalizing it, I mean, you're an icon, uh, and, and I'm using you because you've put yourself out as an icon, but when you're not admitted to the University of Michigan, and you notice that there are people of color who are admitted, who you've concluded made lower grades than you or got lower scores than you, then you focus on them. There's something not right about that. There is no focus on the athletes who got in, the white athletes who got in who got lower scores. There's no focus on the children of alumni who got in who got lower scores. There's no focus on those who made donations to the universities that's zero in on the people of color. It's a sense of entitlement that is zeroed in and focused on people of color. And it creates great discomfort in this country. And what's even worse about it is that it has become almost a pathology, a national pathology. And nobody wants to talk about it. Because if you try and talk about race in any kind of a gathering, the first response is, oh, there you go, playing the race card. There they go again. They're always talking about race. Why can't they talk about it? We have to talk about race because it is at the very core of what is wrong with this country. And nobody wants to deal with it in the same way that an alcoholic doesn't want to deal with his alcoholism. And the first step to recovery from substance abuse and the first step to recovery from this racial pathology that we have is acknowledging that we have a problem. And until we acknowledge it, then we will go nowhere in trying to solve it. And so we soothe ourselves. We make ourselves feel comfortable with pleasant thoughts of, oh, how far we have come. We have a black president now. We've made all this progress. Everything is equal. The playing field is equal. And at the same time that we have this, this black president, we have a young black woman who walks up to a door in, in, at night in, in Dearborn, knocks on the door, and the white man inside pulls out a, a, a shotgun and blasts her face off. We have in Florida a young black boy who does nothing but goes to the store to try and get himself some candy, and he's jumped and killed just because of who he is and where he's walking and how he looks. We have studies that the ACLU has done which shows that the use of marijuana is comparable across racial lines, across racial lines, but if you look, black people are three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than white people. We've done studies which show that the behavior of young people in schools is essentially the same. But you see that the expulsion rates and the suspension rates along color lines are vastly disproportionate for students of color. And we see that there's a correlation between the ex exclusion of students from school and their, tra their, tra their uh, travels into the criminal justice system. And then you want to come up after they've been through all of this and say that everything is equal and we're trying to put a provision on the, on the Constitution that says that it's a level playing field and that we're going to have equal opportunities for all. We will not because there's structural racism, there's institutional racism, and it's present, it, the biases of individuals, the subjective opinions of people are still at work. We have not recovered from this history, and if you don't have protections like affirmative action and other opportunities for universities to ensure diversity, they will, there will be complete and total exclusion. Jen, you want to weigh in? Yeah. We have some other questions up there, too. I'll, I'll be sure and get to you guys. I was sitting in our office one day and got a phone call from a University of California student. Uh, he said he, he was a black student. Um, he said, but at California, uh, you can, at the University of California, you can change your race. There's a form. Uh, you go into the uh, admissions department and you can actually fill out the form and you can be a different race. It's, uh, it's a social construct. A construct. Uh, and the student said, you know, today I went in and I changed my race and now I'm white and I want my white privilege. <laughs> we got a little bit of a chuckle. Um, uh, I'd take equality over any of this any day. Um, because uh, Trevor personalized this and talked about Carl Cohen, um, Carl Cohen has been an NAACP member for uh, over 35 years. Uh, and, and so your talk about uh, those of us who are on this side not knowing anything about those organizations um, he's been an NAACP well, member. That, what that mean? So what? So You're much. the one who brought that no, up. You brought um, that. On top of that, I've never once been accused of talking about this subject in the abstract. Uh, my story has been all over the news for 
uh, over a decade now. I talk about this. I talk about this in very, very personal terms. I have been personally affected by this. Uh, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, has agreed that me and people who were similarly similarly situated had been discriminated against by the University of Michigan. It is personal, but there are times to bring up statistics and to talk about what's actually happening. Uh, maybe, just maybe, those of us who were pushing for equality through the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative did not go to the Civil Rights Department and to the NAACP because you fought against someone like me, you supported someone like me being discriminated against. And that's what the Supreme Court said. I was discriminated against. Your, the organizations that you just talked about supported that discrimination. Um, we've talked a little bit about socioeconomic status. I believe that socioeconomic status, it's, it's fair. It should be something that is considered uh, when it comes to university admissions. Uh, but I don't believe that it should be based on race. Someone who, you talked about first generational students. Someone who's the first in their, their family to go to college. Maybe they should get a, an extra look. Um, I, I was being interviewed by 60 Minutes um, many years ago now uh, by Ed Bradley. Uh, and Ed Bradley, he had said to me that he had just been on the University of Michigan's campus uh, earlier that day and had interviewed a student. Uh, he was graduating within a couple of weeks and he was going on to law school. And he said, but he grew up and he would, he would describe his situation growing up as being less than poor. He had five brothers and sisters, each from a different father. His mother was on drugs. He was basically the, the parental figure in the house through high school. He thought maybe he had a 3.0 GPA and he didn't remember what his ACT score was, which tells me it probably wasn't all that great. And he said to me, but now he's, he's going on uh, to law school and he's graduating from the University of Michigan and what would you say to that student? And I looked at Ed Bradley and I said, you never mentioned his race. What does that have to do with anything? Any student, regardless of their skin color, that's in that situation deserves a second look. They deserve to be looked at, 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 at differently than a student who's had two parents, who has had all of the advantages, and has a 3.8 GPA. I agree with that, but it should not be based on race. Uh, the climate Jim, on the Jim, University I, of Michigan's campus, we've, we've can this I, has can been... I just, can yeah. I just interrupt you? I just want to get to a couple more. Can I talk about the climate on the University yeah. of Michigan campus really quick? Yeah. Uh, it, we've talked about, uh, Trevor and Mark have said that the climate on the University of Michigan's campus is so horrible for people of, people of color, specifically blacks. Uh, it's very I interesting to me because you know, the Black Student Union has gotten a considerable amount of press over the last couple of weeks. And uh, the Black Student Union on Martin Luther King Day stood on campus and had seven demands, uh, of which included more funding, uh, special scholarships, special housing, uh, and, and outright quotas, which are currently unconstitutional in the state. Uh, and they said that if they, if they didn't hear back from the university within seven days, that they would take physical action. They later said that they did not mean violence, but they said they will do whatever it takes and take physical action. And the University of Michigan rewarded this bullying uh, by a sit-down meeting and with $300,000. Now contrast that to the <coughs> college libertarians who uh, sent a letter to the president and to the regents and said, you know, we've been in, in um, the classroom and uh, our positions have been belittled. Uh, they've had professors write on the board, um, you know, Anne, Anne Rand, and put a cross through it and said, you know, one day when you grow up, you'll know that, um, that, that she's crazy. Um, they, they've, they've never received much funding from the university. And they send a letter saying, you know, if you're serious about diversity, we'd request that you have um, uh, economics courses that are, um, that are free to, that, that expose our viewpoints um, and, and suggested a few other things and said, we're not going to demand these things because that's not in our nature. What did they get? A, a, an email from an administrative assistant patting them on the head. Uh, I would suggest that the people who are, that have a hostile environment on the University of Michigan's campus are likely conservatives and libertarians. Uh, and I think that that, um, uh, that situation really, really highlights that. Um, we have some more questions. The gentleman in the back. Yes, thank you. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for being here. I'm here, I, I know this is a very really lowly topic, 
But I, I'm getting a great deal of hypocrisy. Uh, for example, and this is no attack, but your experience at MIT by your admission, but you were admitted. You were given the opportunity. What you made of that is a whole different story. But the, the implication that you are hiding and you're doing this for the betterment of colored folks who are not qualified to be at these institutions, it doesn't cut muster. Uh, but my, my question specifically for Ms. Grass, the very fact that we are here discussing affirmative action clearly implies there was something wrong with the system, right? I think that's, that would be the conclusion, the last <coughs> conclusion. Let's assume we do away with uh, affirmative action. What would prevent our society from going back to what it was that required us to implement it from uh, affirmative action to begin with? That's a, that's a Before she answers, can I say yeah. something here? Um, you know, it, it's really interesting the kind of stereotyping that goes on here. Okay, it, you're stereotyping me because I'm I'm a white middle class guy. Let me tell you something. Okay, my mother was German. She grew up in Nazi Germany. When she was 16, she was arrested by the Gestapo. The fact that she survived the war is a miracle. My father was Russian. Okay, he escaped the communists twice. The last time, he barely got out ahead of the secret police and wanted to arrest him and shoot him. When my parents came here as immigrants, they met in a refugee camp. They came here with nothing. Okay, that is the typical story of many Americans. You know, it's not your color that determines uh, many of the things that have happened to you. You know, it's life experiences. And you know, your question about going back to other things, excuse me, but there are many federal laws and state laws that prohibit discrimination. And this idea that we're going to go back to 1964 just doesn't recognize the reality of this country. And I told one fast story that just it really expresses how different we are today. Okay, a couple of years ago, I took my three kids to King's Dominion in Virginia. King's Dominion is like a six flags. Okay, uh, huge complex, and, and remember, this is close to Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy, and, 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 and uh, part of the big fight for civil rights in the 1960s. King's Dominion was filled with interracial couples, walking around, having a good time, and nobody thought anything twice about it. And that tells you how much we have changed. Are we a perfect country today? No. But we're not going to continue to make advances in this area if the government says, well, it's OK to discriminate in favor of some people, uh, but not OK to discriminate against others. The way to go forward is to say that all discrimination is wrong and that we're going to punish those who engage in discrimination. I'll, ju I'll just echo what Han said in that I, th I believe that it's a vicious cycle. Uh, we. We have a horrible history uh, in this country when it comes to issues involving race. There's no denying that. Um, we had a bright future uh, when we said that we shall move forward uh, by treating people without regard to race. And when the government stuck its nose in that, it started doing just the opposite. Uh, and as someone who has been outspoken on this issue and in, in the public spotlight, I have a lot of people that whisper in my ear and say, I've been affected by these policies, and, and uh, they're bitter about it. Um, I, I chose to do something rather than to be bitter. I chose to stand up for myself. Um, but there's a, um, it, it is a vicious cycle, and it festers. And I, I don't think that discrimination against anyone is the solution. And I, I think that the way to get right, on, back on the right path is to treat people equally. You know, this year is the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, I believe that that act was put in place to bring about colorblind government. Uh, it was to bring about being treated without regard to race by our government. Well, that doesn't mean that we don't physically see color, but it means that our government when interacting with us is, is blind to it. They don't 
get dole out benefits or penalties because of your skin color. Um, today, I, I think that we're, we're on the wrong path. Not just in university admissions, that, that's the focus today because frankly that's the only thing that the radical group by any means necessary and the ACLU challenged uh, was, it was with respect to college admissions. The Michigan Civil Rights Initiative said that there shall not be discrimination or preferential treatment uh, in three areas, public contracting, public employment, and public education. We include the part about discrimination in there, so there is a, 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 a safety net, so that discrimination is also illegal, preferential treatment or discrimination. Both are unconstitutional, both have the same recourse. Um, it, you know, today, the, the Obama administration, they've announced that there's now um, race, race preferences, if you will, in in uh, penalizing students in school. If a, if a kid is disruptive in school, right now the, the Obama administration wants to um, say, well, if you've had s too many uh, Hispanic students that have been suspended, you can't suspend that student if he's Hispanic. They want to balance that out. I think that's wrong. We should be treating kids and, and people, Americans, as individuals, not members of a group. I promised uh, Matt we'd keep this uh, to an hour, so let me take uh, one more question. Uh, Patrick, you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in, I, I used to, like, to full disclosure, I used to represent Jen way back when when she did this as local counsel. So I've, I've been involved in this issue for a fair amount myself. Um, one of the things that I think is what, Mark, your your answer indicates is that you're, you're a lot of it seems to be based on the historical discrimination or societal problems of, of fixing this, and that um, nobody in this room knows what it's like to walk in your shoes or, or in these kind of shoes in general. And I, I'm wondering how we ever get to where we're willing to say that this is enough and it's done. What's, what's the finish line? Because right now, you know, we, we just discussed, okay, well, this is what the vote was, but then. Uh, Mr. Coleman was saying, well, yeah, but it wasn't the right racial vote because the whites voted this way and the blacks voted this way. So when can we say, all right, we, whatever the historical discrimination problem is, I can look at the society. Do, do we have to have it that it's 55% of each group votes? Um, is it that we have certain benchmarks? What, what is it when everybody at that, up there at that table is going to say, okay, we're, we're done. This is it. We're, we're now treating everybody as Americans and not as members of groups. Well, you know, we, we've been trained as a society uh, to uh, want problems resolved quickly. I mean, they're always resolved quickly on television. I mean, you, you turn it on, the hor most horrible problem is resolved within 60 minutes in a drama. In a situation comedy, it's resolved in 30 minutes. Okay? But that's not life. And, uh, you know, we're, we're confronted as a society with a problem uh, that, uh, I'm sad to say, may not be possible to solve in the sense that we would like it to be solved. And it, it has a lot to do with the fact that the United States itself is based, its foundation uh, is, is genocide, territorial theft and slavery. So that, you know, Mr. von Spotkowski's parents may have come here after having suffered a great deal in Europe, but they came here voluntarily. You know, there are a whole lot of people who, whose ancestors did not come here because they wanted to. And that has created a, a, a huge problem that may not be possible to solve. And so while you know, everyone would like to say, well, let's, let's just say we're col a colorblind society. Everyone is equal. Let's treat everyone equally. I mean, if you say that, you're lying to yourself. And if you want to tell yourself some truth, if you're white, all you have to do is to say that your life is completely unchanged, except in one respect, that tomorrow you work, wake up as an African person. Yeah, Chris Rock here. Now, okay. what, what I'm asking you is, is when, when do we say that, I mean, you're, are you telling me that we can never get to a place where the four of you are going to look at each other and say, we're it, this is it, we've achieved what we think is possible, that there is equality in this country? Is that impossible? Or is there, what factors would you look at 
or perhaps Mr. Coleman, if you want to weigh in on this, what would you say, this is when we've done, this is when I think we're at least close enough that we can get past all of this American's original sins. Is there a possibility that we can? And if so, from your perspective, what do we have to do to get to that day? The first thing we have to do is acknowledge that we have a problem and we're a long way from doing that. You can't solve a problem until you acknowledge it. And if you want a date from me, I can't give you one. And there, there is, we'll, 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 we'll know it when we see it. And, and right now we know that there is not equality. And, and it is not in the foreseeable future. And I'm, you know, sorry to say that. And that's something that people don't want to hear. But it's the truth. It's the sad, hard truth that because of the sins of our ancestors, we're stuck with a problem that's not going to go away for a very, 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 very long time. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but I don't think I'm going to see it. And I don't know that my kid is going to see it. It's just a problem. And until the pro as long as the problem is here, we got to deal with it. And if you don't want to deal with it, you know, you're going to have continuing frustration and problems. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, you know what, I, I actually um, can, I can't give you a deadline, but I can give you a signifier. And something that I think, you know, first of all, let, let me just share with you as perfect. The Michigan Civil Rights Initiative is bogus. It's rest on a lie. It's racist, right? The whole proposition is. You know, and the fact, and if you want to know, you know, at what point, you know, when perhaps, you know, when, when we've not solved the problem, you know, but there's some sort of critical mass of agreement, you know, let's, let's the, the, unfortunately our opponents kind of suspend reality here. You had a multi-coalition, you know, with this whole debate, the multi-coalition was on the side of opposition to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. You had the military. You had the business community. You had African American, Pan African, African nationalists, militants, conservatives. You had everybody from you know from Panthers to you know these right wing NAACP members and stuff. You know, which which like I said scares frightens people because they don't know anything about the NAACP. You had the Urban League. You had the religious community, white churches, black churches, gays, lesbians, lesbians, uh, Asians, Asians, Latinos. You know, you know all oppose. To the Michigan Civil Rights Center. You had a multi-role coalition that agreed that it was important, you know, for the top-tier universities and for businesses and for government, right, to embrace the diversity and to give people a chance because when we use all of our human resources and not keep the system rigged against other human beings, against other Americans, you know, we, we're a much more effective country. So if you want to know, you know, at what point you know, when we reach, not Nirvana, but where we have some sort of common understanding, it's when you could bring all these different groups of people together around an issue like this. And so I, to me, that would suggest to me, even if I knew nothing about affirmative action or the, or, or the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative at all, if I saw the people who were behind this, you know, where everybody from Colin Powell to the head of General Motors to the heads of the top universities to the community colleges to teachers to churches to civil rights to community activists, you know, that to me would suggest that this is something positive, this is something good. And on the other side, if it's almost exclusively white people who are belligerent and who are treating African Americans as if we're some sort of, you know, aliens in our own land, you know, and blaming us for all their frustrations, you know, in life, you know, that would tell me that that's the wrong side of the equation. So just look to where all, everyone is at, where you, regardless of what five wealthy conservative white men and someone like Clarence Thomas has to say. Okay. Thank you. Well, I don't, we're, we're done. Thank you for our panelists. Thank you very much.